Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin in just a second and will be recorded. Feel free to connect with the campaign for grade level reading on social media. On Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. Please use hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's webinar, and we will be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. And once again, feel free to connect with us on social media. On Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR. And on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. Okay, once again, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sierra Sanchez, and I will be behind the scenes helping to produce this webinar. I have just a few housekeeping details before we get started. First, we would love for you to introduce yourself. So please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city or state, and your organization. Be sure to select panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. All attendees are in listen-only mode, but we encourage your engagement by posting questions in the Q&A box. We will dedicate the last 20 to 30 minutes to respond to the questions you post during the discussion. The webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed on Friday to all who registered. And there will, we will be posting a brief on-screen evaluation during Q&A, and we highly encourage you to respond. This just helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement at the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Lastly, before we start, I would just like to call your attention to our upcoming GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars. As you'll see next week, November 3rd on Election Day, we will not be having a webinar, but we do encourage you to vote and get out to the polls. On November 10th at 1230 Eastern Time, we have Crucible of Practice, a peer-to-peer -peer learning and sharing series for GLR community and state leads. Dr. Monroe Richards will share the success, challenges, and lessons learned to date of the GLR campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina, Charlotte Reads. 3 p.m. Eastern Time on that same day, we have the future of early math, what the science and practice tells us. And lastly, on November 17th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we have a funder to funder conversation with the Clinton Family Foundation and Too Small to Fail. And at 3 p.m., we have parent coaching, a key ingredient to parent success. We will be sure to add a link in the chat box for more information and registration for these upcoming learning opportunities. Joining you now is Yoli Flores, Chief Learning Officer for the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Sierra, and welcome. And thank you all once again for joining us for today's GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar, The Federal Role in Advancing Digital Equity. If you are one of the almost 6,000 individuals that have joined us for our weekly learning conversations since we launched last year, particularly if you have participated since the pandemic hit in March, You'll know that the Campaign for Grade Level Reading has made learning loss recovery a priority in our work. One element of this work is to engage thinkers, leaders, researchers, practitioners, all through our GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars to help us all learn, plan, and act with urgency in an effort to slow, stop, and reverse learning loss. This webinar on digital equity is the fifth in a series. Today, we have examined the scope, extent, and the dimensions of the digital equity problem. We've learned about emerging and scalable solutions at the local level, including the work in Chicago with Chicago Connects and other municipalities. And more recently, we spotlighted exemplary statewide efforts, including Texas, Connecticut, North Dakota, and other states all working to close the home digital divide. But since that first webinar on digital equity in May, we've learned that state and local efforts can only take us so far. Fully closing the digital divide at scale requires federal leadership, federal policy, and federal investments. 
So today's webinar begins to look more closely at that federal role. And we're delighted and honored to have Dr. Katz return. She was in our first webinar on digital equity and this time as our moderator. <clears throat> She'll be engaging us in a conversation with three leaders who've been tracking and developing proposals for Congress to consider. And we'll always also hear from three colleagues who've been part of our digital equity series, serving as commentators, reflecting on the presentations and sharing their insights on how we advance a greater federal role in an effort to ensure access to learning to all students, most especially students from low-income families. So with that, let me introduce to you, for those of you who have not met Dr. Vicki Katz, Dr. Vicki Katz is an associate professor in the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University. Sarah, you can advance the slide. She conducts research with children growing up in low income, working class and immigrant families. And she investigates how family technology use influences skill development and access to learning resources and how digital inequality affects learning opportunities for children. Her research has been supported by the Spencer, Grable, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations. And she is the author of more than 30 articles, books, and reports. Dr. Katz also currently serves as co-editor of Journal of Children and Media and is on the board of directors for the National Center for Families Learning. So welcome back, Vicki, Dr. Katz. Thanks for being our moderator today, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Yoli, and thank you all of you for being with us today. I can see from the introductions that we have coast to coast and everything in between represented here, and it speaks both to the strength of the campaign, but also to the commitment of each and every one of you that you're here with us. So thank you for that, and thank you to the campaign for inviting me to host this incredibly important discussion. I don't have to tell anybody on this call that we have just kicked off a bare minimum school year with millions of students in either hybrid or fully remote learning environments indefinitely. Beyond the public health crisis we're facing, we are also facing a long-term learning crisis as questions about broadband infrastructure and investment in digital tools for students have become the urgent issues of the day. What is the federal government's role in addressing those digital inequalities? And what could it be during the pandemic and beyond? We have an absolute all-star set of experts with us today to consider exactly those questions and to shed some light on how federal response can relate to state and local efforts. I'm gonna introduce everybody who's joining us at once so that we can have a free flowing conversation in the time that we have together. Larry Irving is CEO of the Irving Group the technology consulting firm that produced the first empirical study on the digital divide. And Irving has also served as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information and Administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, also known as the NTIA, during the Clinton administration. He was the first African-American inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame for his work identifying and advocating for solutions to the digital divide. Thank you very much for being here, Larry. Angela Seifer is Executive Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and has been a champion for digital equity since 1997. From physically setting up computer labs in underserved areas and managing local digital inclusion programs to consulting for the US Department of Commerce and testifying before Congress. In recognition of her tireless efforts, Government Technology Magazine named Angela one of their top 25 doers, dreamers, and drivers of 2019. Thank you, Angela. Divya Sridhar is the Policy Director for Digital Equity at Excel in Ed. For the last five years, she served as Public Policy Advisor for the K-12 Education Policy at McGraw-Hill, and prior to that, she advocated for policy changes on broadband, health systems connectivity, and telemedicine in various roles within the healthcare industry. She holds a master's in public policy from the University of Texas at Dallas and a PhD in public policy from George Mason University. Uh, if we could advance the slide. 
Uh, we have three commentators who will follow with uh, their comments and reactions after our, our three panelists give their remarks. The, the first is uh, John Ferguson, who is a fellow at the Patterson Foundation in Sarasota, Florida, where he manages the Digital Access for All initiative, which advances multi-sector efforts to enhance access to technology, to foster inclusion and well-being. Jack Lynch is the Director of State Engagements and the Digital Bridge K-12 Project at Education Superhighway, the leading nonprofit focused on upgrading the internet's access in every public school classroom in America. So he's got a small job. Since 2012, Education Superhighway has helped to connect 43 million students to the minimum speed necessary for digital learning. And last but certainly not least, Claire Park is a program associate with New America's Open Technology Institute, where she researches and writes about technology policy issues, including broadband access and competition, as well as privacy. Previously, she was a fellow at the German Academic Exchange Service and an associate at Third Bridge. So no exaggeration when I say we have an all-star cast and uh, very much looking forward to the conversation today. So Larry, if we can begin with you. Can you, let's, uh, let's begin perhaps at the beginning. How did we get to where we are on the federal policy front with regard to digital inequity? Thanks, Vicki. And um, it's an honor to be here with uh, my colleagues talking about these important issues. You know, if you, you really have to go back to the telephone issues. Um, I was working on Capitol Hill in the 1980s and, and most people don't realize this now, but 50 years after the Telecommunications Act of 1934, which kind of set up our telephone system, there were still huge inequities in terms of who had a telephone. If you were black or brown, um, you were, uh, those communities were about 80, 81% of telephone penetration across the nation. Native American reservations <clears throat> were often at 70% and sometimes as low as 50%. Um, and in America writ large was over 90%, which meant that white Americans were at 90, 90, 93, 94, 95% telephone penetration. So back then, my then boss, a congressman named Mickey Leland, uh, petitioned the FCC to create something called the Lifeline Program. And we still have Lifeline with us today. And, and the purpose of a Lifeline and another program called LinkUp were to get people affordable access to telephone equipment and then get them access to affordable telephone rates so that everyone in America, uh, irrespective of economic station, ethnicity would have access to the telephone. So fast forward, it's 10 years later, I'm an assistant secretary of commerce and no longer on Capitol Hill. And somehow or another, I wind up um, as a lawyer being involved with our nation's internet policy um, development. And I was out in Palo Alto, California, um, in Cupertino, California, uh, visiting the tech companies. And I was there with um, Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown. Went down to Cupertino, California, and went to this beautiful intermediate school, elementary school. And these great kids, and they were sitting eight to a table. And every one of those kids had was sitting in front of an iMac. Um, and that iMac was connected to the, to the then nascent internet because we're only about 15 or 20 million people on the whole planet connected to the internet. But those kids in Cupertino were among that blessed 15 or 20 million. And I, I was gratified for those kids. It was absolutely beautiful to see it. And later that day, Secretary Brown and I drove up to um, Thurgood Marshall High School in Hunters Point, San Francisco, California. And we saw a bunch of young African-American, Latino, Asian kids most of whom were in a school lunch program, kids of modest means. And those kids didn't have a clue that a computer existed, much less the internet. And we began to see even then that there was this divide between these two deserving groups of kids. How do we make sure that we equalize it out? And then I went to my elementary school. Uh, you talk about working, talk, uh, working with working class communities. I'm from Queens, New York, Southeast Queens Hollis is where I grew up. And I went to my elementary school a week or two later. And I noticed that the most impressive technology in that school for these little kids who were so deserving was the metal detector that they went through every morning. Um, so they didn't have the internet, they didn't have a computer, but they had the um, uh, metal detector. So we started working on trying to, um, anecdotes are good, but they don't really drive public policy. You need data. Um, the Commerce Department has something called the um, uh, Census Bureau. Um, and so we, we um, I co contacted my colleague who was an undersecretary who ran the um, uh, Census Bureau and we started a survey, a 50,000 purpose survey. We wanted to get a baseline in the early days of the internet as to who was connected and who wasn't connected. That was the first survey. We did two more surveys during my tenure at uh, NTIA, but that first survey that showed that first gap, that helped us get the E-rate. 
um, because we could show that there were some kids who were connected, some kids who weren't connected, because we were doing some uh, programs, we were able to um, get Congress in 1996 to pass the E-rate, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, I think. But what we found in those days was that there were five types of people who were less connected to the internet. If you were poor, if you were a minority, if you were rural, if you um, were elderly, or if you had less of an education, you were less likely to be connected to the internet. 25 years later after those first reports, it's almost exactly the same. The folks who are poor, who are elderly, who are um, less educated, who are minorities, um, who live in rural America are less likely to have um, internet access. And so we started there. Um, we are where we are. There have been a lot of efforts, whether it's the E-rate, whether it's um, Lifeline. Um, I think a lot of states and localities have begun to address this issue, but we still are at a situation where 25 million American families are not fully connected to the internet or connected only by a cell phone. And even if we use the definition that we use in Washington on what's connectivity of 25-3, there are those who feel that's not really broadband and it's near broadband. So Larry, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm so struck by this historical arc and that in some ways everything old is new again, but also that we need to think about how digital inequality has evolved rather than resolved. Um, and that uh, we've still got a long way to go because as the technology keeps moving, keeping pace with it in an equitable way becomes an ongoing challenge around which we are unlikely to ever feel that we have completely accomplished a mission, but it's a mission that we, that we continue in. Um, in terms of where we are currently, where is federal funding going and where do you think it might be spent more efficaciously or more equitably? I mean, and thanks for your point, because, you know, the, the great thing about the universal service concept has always been an evolving concept. If you think you went from, you know, mm -hmm. party lines to dial tones to rotary phones to whatever, we've always, it's always been uh, evolutionary, not revolutionary. And it's important, I think, for people to think about the internet in context, that it seems like it's new technology, but it overlays on inequalities that came long before it existed, right? It's, right, it's and, a wonderful and, point to make. It, it's it's funny because I, I I'll take you one other place backwards. Um, I was in San Francisco last year. I went to an art museum, and and Andy I think has heard this, but others may not have heard this. Um, I went to this museum and I saw this beautiful um art exhibit, and they called it New Light, and New Light was about when folks in rural Alabama got electricity, and what the artist was trying to convey was that Black Alabamans in rural Alabama got their lights turned on five years after white Alabamans got their lights turned on. And think about the middle of the depression, 1929, 1934, whatever, and you're five years behind. And then take that into the digital age where we literally have families, not just black families, not just Latino families, but poor families, rural families who are five or six years behind because the internet, when I was doing digital, we were talking about dial up, you know, business bomb, you know, we were using our AOL, whatever we were using, we weren't doing broadband. Well, now we're using broadband, so it's even more problematic. And so most of the debate, to answer, to answer the direct question you asked me, most of the debate going on in America today is over broadband connectivity. Um, and we're spending money on Lifeline, but not enough. If you have Lifeline in America today, you get $9.25. With that $9.25 per household. So if you have a grandmom living with a mom and dad living with three or four children, with that $9.25, you can buy one of either um, a mobile device, a landline telephone, or a very basic um, um, cable, con um, cable or broadband connection. And 925 doesn't buy you much in broadband as anybody who has broadband knows. But you can only get one of those three. So if mom needs a phone um, to go to work with, or dad wants a phone for grandma so she can call her doctor, or they both want a junior and junior to have access to um, broadband at home, they only get one, one of those options. So that's one place we spend money. The other, we have the E-rate program, which connects um, schools and libraries um, to broadband connectivity. Um, and then we have a few scattered um, Ilya Mazinari programs that uh, cable companies and telephone companies uh, throw at it. So in Washington right now, what's kind of happened that's problematic is the digital divide has become politicized as almost everything does. We have roughly 20 to 25 million families that are in dire need of internet connectivity. And most of the attention currently in Washington is focused on rural families. So the FCC has a $20 million fund to, uh, to help connect 
rural Americans. And I am all for spending that $20 million to connect rural Americans. But there are three to four times as many families who don't have broadband, not because they don't have access to it the way that rural families don't have access to it, because they simply can't afford it. And we're not spending almost any money trying to connect families who have an affordability gap. So we have an access gap in rural America. We have an affordability gap in urban America and suburban America. We probably need 80 to, 20, 80 to $100 million to solve all of those problems. And instead, we're only focusing on the $20 million for rural America. And with three different um, stimulus bills, and even in the fourth that was proposed, there were almost no dollars directly um, uh, addressing the problem during a pandemic of internet connectivity for children in our schools. And let's think about this. One out of three children in America right now don't have broadband access or can't afford broadband access. And one of 10 children in America don't have broadband and don't have a computing device in the middle of a pandemic. And some of those kids, like the kids I in my elementary school in Queens, New York, have not been in school since March. 43% of them were a year behind before March. Think about what happens to a kid in terms of learning loss from March to November of virtually no school at nine or 10 or 12 years old. What it suggests really is that it's time to start thinking about broadband, whether it's in hotspot form or something else, as something akin to the textbooks that schools give children for free, right? This is the conduit to education at the moment. And it's a striking uh, note you make that none of the stimulus bills have been you know, sort of focused on the, the affordability gap, access maybe, but not affordability. I'm sure we're gonna pick that up as we go through um, our discussion today. Let me, um, before we, you know, sw switch focus a little bit, uh, let me ask you to highlight uh, just quickly an innovative effort that I know you've been involved in because a lot of what's going on right now is going to require innovative solutions and shortcuts because of those realities of, of what kids are not getting access to in schools. I think many of us have seen, you know, pictures, for example, of the, you know, sisters sitting uh, outside the Taco Bell um, with their school provided laptops to do their schoolwork. Um, tell me a little bit about this innovative effort that I know you've been involved in that uh, uses local schools, hospitals, and libraries as intermediaries to expand local access to students and families. Tell us a little bit about that. It's funny you mentioned the little girls uh, sitting outside the Taco Bell because last week people may have seen the little boy um, who was walking to his school, sitting outside of a school in Tucson uh, so he could do his, do his work because he didn't have access to the internet at home. You know, during the Clinton days, we um, connected every school, every hospital, every library, every rural health clinic in America to the internet. We did broadband connectivity, every, every one of those. And it's funny, you're gonna have Charlotte is gonna be the next CDLR um, seminar. And Charlotte was a pioneer. We had something called Charlotte's Web, Driver's Ed for the Information Superhighway. So you never see Charlotte, I think it was pioneering the concept of libraries with broadband. But one of the things that right now, the E-rate does not allow those schools to take that broadband that's inside those buildings and broadcast it outside those buildings. For relatively affordable rates, we could get access to spectrum, we could put an antenna on every public facility that already has a broadband connective pipe into the school, and we could use those schools, use those libraries, use community colleges, use um, um, public health centers to radiate a community so that there's a broadband wireless connection in that community. Um, some places I know in Utah, some places in California are pioneering it, we need to do it more because those kids in Hollis, Queens or those kids in Hunter's Point, imagine if they could from home without having to cart around a hotspot, without, but, but in their homes could get access to broadband internet. That's the dream and that's something that I'm hope, hopeful uh, we'll be able to start pioneering and, and moving on uh, with some alacrity next year. Well, the, and the local will lead the federal in those cases, right? Because it becomes proof of concept for, for, for something that can scale. Go. And, and you have to change the E-rate um, because right now the E-rate regulations won't allow what we call two and through will allow two, but not through. So we want to make sure that we are able to do use the money to get to the schools. But then once those schools already have a broadband connection, why can't we use those connections that allow children or low income families in that community to have access to uh, the broadband capabilities? It sounds like a very good question for people on this call to be uh, raising with their, their representatives uh, before too long. Thank you. Uh, let me, Thank you so much. Let me let me turn focus for a, a little bit to Angela uh, Seifer. If I can, Angela, are you here? I am. I think the host needs to start my video again. 
Uh huh. Well, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a conversation about digital inequality if we didn't have at least one glitch, right? Um, well, I'll talk to this beautiful picture of your blue glasses in the meantime. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Welcome back, Angela. Nice Thank to see you, you again. Um, so let me uh, let me start by asking you. I know that you've got a, a very sort of well rounded sense of of how these things work, not just from the from the local level all the way to the federal. So. Let's start at the sort of broad picture. What do you see as the most critical elements from a policy perspective for addressing digital equity in this particular, you know, sort of surreal moment that we're all we're all living through? I think we can start from Larry's point that the federal government has only been investing in the availability of broadband service, not the adoption of broadband service. So I encourage everyone who's looking at data to be careful which data you're looking at availability of broadband service or adoption of broadband service. Uh, the adoption has to do with affordability and digital literacy skills, primarily. Uh, research tells us it's often a mixture of barriers, not just one barrier. Uh, in the United States, the, we, we kind of have a broadband subsidy, as Larry mentioned, we have Lifeline, uh, but his warnings I think are completely on spot on. Uh, it is $9.25. Most of the Lifeline participants use it for their mobile service, their mobile phone service, which comes with three gig of data. You cannot really say that is, you know, mo uh, broadband service. Uh, there's not, there's very few wireline services. There's not a significant number of wireline, meaning cable, DSL, fiber, uh, broadband service available with that $9.25. So we need a real subsidy. We need, people need really help with paying their bills. That's connected to the reality that in the United States, broadband is a commodity. It is, it's, it's not a utility. We like to think it's a utility because we're like, oh my gosh, I have to have my internet. So it feels like a utility, but functionally, legally, it's not a utility. It's a commodity, it's bought and sold. Uh, and those of us who are purchasing it have very little control and power over what our choices are. So the subsidy is one. The next one is digital literacy. So I would set that as high priority. We need to fund digital literacy. We don't require it, it in workforce programs. It's not, we don't really have a system for helping adults with digital literacy issues. The Digital Equity Act uh, that was proposed last year and has then the contents of it were put in the HEROES Act and in other bills, uh, it's, it has that funding for community-based programs around digital literacy. What it also has is funding for states to create digital equity plans. Uh, I really wonder if things would have looked different during the pandemic if the states had already created plans because then they would have known what their assets were at a minimum. They would have known what was happening in their state. They didn't know what was happening in their state. They didn't know what the barriers were and they didn't know what the assets were. And then the last one I'm going to mention is uh, we need to know how much broadband costs in the United States. We don't have good data on that. Why don't we have good data on that? Because the FCC doesn't really share out that data. Why don't they share out that data? Because the internet service providers don't really want them to share out that data. So we have some vague kind of numbers, but we don't know like per area. You can't say, okay, in this area, this county or this state even, it's more expensive than over here and then be able to make adjustments. Right, so I'm struck by a few things you said there that really have particular resonance in the middle of a pandemic. You know, if most people are using the federal subsidy for a smartphone, if, you know, most of us know it was impossible to use a smartphone to do schoolwork prior to the pandemic when you were doing a homework assignment, it is now totally impossible to be on Zoom hours and hours a day. And that's if you've got one kid, right? I mean, you're going you're gonna to blow through uh, what's been provided uh, on that smartphone probably within a week if, if you get there. Um, and the other thing I was uh, was struck by there is, you know, we've, there's so much that so many of the people on this call know about districts sort of struggling to have to have any idea of what families in their area had or could have access to. And that really reflects your, you know, your comment that the states having digital equity plans might have meant that every school administrator wasn't suddenly trying to figure out their own plan. 
um, in the midst of all the chaos of shutting down in March, that there that there might have been some clear picture for them uh, in terms of what was available, so that they could make more informed choices for the, their students and families. Um, so let's let's uh, focus on that for just a minute. You know, we've spoken you know previously about the minute that we start talking about students, it places that kid in a school um, and separates them from. The, the environment in which they are now not just, you know, having their, their, their out of school lives, but for many kids are now having their school experience as well. But students are part of families, uh, not really, you know, part of uh, school buildings, especially at the moment. Why do you think it's important from a policy perspective for digital equity solutions to focus on children in families, not just students in schools? Uh, this is a particularly big soapbox I have. I get really riled up about it. Um, I like to say, do kids live alone? Do we think kids live alone? Uh, <laughs> I hope kids aren't living alone. Uh, they live with adults in their lives, and those adults need that internet access and the skills and the right device for the task not only to help that child be successful in school, because we know involved parents are key, so now involved parents are key online, uh, but then also it's that parent being able to do the things they need to do to have that safe and structured and positive environment for their child, which we all know, try to apply for a job without internet, try to learn new skills without internet, try to do your banking, anything really. And so if the parent's life is harder because they don't have this valuable tool that those of us who can't afford it certainly make sure and have access to make sure that we do in fact have then then their you know life is more difficult and then that makes that child's life more difficult absolutely right and so let me um let me ask you what activity you're seeing at the federal level at the moment that you are finding the most compelling what, where are the bright spots and what do you think are the gaps that we need to address most urgently? I think it's really astounding that all the activity has occurred at the local level during the pandemic. Um, the most valuable resource that the federal government provided was the CARES Act. But CARES Act could be used for anything. So then communities were in the tough spot of being like, do we buy food or do we buy internet? Oh, that's like heart wrenching. There wasn't a dedicated funding source or program to help with the connectivity, the devices, the digital literacy skills. That is really necessary. So the solutions we saw came from the ground and we should all celebrate those solutions and talk about how awesome they are. But they need help, right? They need help from the federal government and, it's, and we need to make sure it addresses all the barriers. One of the first things NDIA did when we cr were created six years ago was create definitions. So there are definitions of digital equity and digital inclusion. Digital equity is the goal. This is where we want to get to. And individuals and communities having full access to information, communication, technology for whatever it is they need to do. And then digital inclusion is the how. This is that affordable home broadband in your home, right? Um, the public access, look, it was a workaround before. It's a really terrible workaround now. So it has to be in the home. The right device for the task, because we all know mobile phones are not cutting it. And the digital literacy, um, which often includes just basic tech support. So those are those are the ways that we get to the digital equity. So the ways that the federal government needs to be involved is in all of those ways, supporting those local efforts. And I can say, like I don't have I don't have data, but I can tell you anecdotally that places that already had activities going on around digital inclusion looked to me like they were more well prepared. Right, they were able to move more quickly. They were able to figure out what to do. A great example is Cleveland. They didn't really have it all figured out, but they had a person at the Cleveland Foundation who'd been doing some research. He had been talking to people. And so when, in fact, he had NDIA write a couple reports for him. When it all, when COVID hit, the whole community turns and looks at this person. <laughs> They're like, you know what to do. And he did, in fact, right, because he had already been digging into it and had information on it. And they were able to quickly set up a really large coalition around the issue because they had belief that there had been enough going on in the community that they were like, okay, he was And it was really, it turns out, 
I mean, it's all not based on one person, but he was able to point. There's an expert in digital literacy over there. The library knows this. Those community-based organizations know this. So he's able to point to folks to be like, okay, this is who you should talk to. Because he wasn't the only one with information, but he was the one that could point to what was going on in the community. He's the central node in the network. Yeah, I found that fascinating. Mm -hmm. And just as a data point that I think reinforces what you're saying, the US Census Bureau kept track in the spring of how many hours parents were spending doing remote learning with their kids. And it turns out that there's a negligent gap in with regard to income level. Parents of all income and socioeconomic statuses were sitting next to their kids for roughly the same amount of time. And yet every study that has come out has shown that there are significant gaps in terms of the learning losses that were suffered over that course of time. So it's not for lack of parental involvement, but it does absolutely harken back to the you know, multi-pronged efforts you're talking about around digital inclusion. Do these families have the hardware and the connectivity that they need? Do they have the human support that they need to be able to actualize those connections is critical to how we slow the learning loss and start to reverse it, no question. Thank you so much, Angela, we'll, we'll be back. Um, but let's turn to Divya, if we can, and um, have a conversation about how the federal role impacts states, um, because uh, those are the concerns that I'm sure are on the minds of a lot of the folks on this call. So can you, let me ask you about uh, some of the innovative state level efforts you've seen enacted with the CARES Act funding that you'd like to spotlight now that we're six months out, that feels like at least six years. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Vicki, and thanks to everybody thank on you. this call for listening in. Uh, great to participate today. Uh, I think when we uh, look at what states are doing, obviously it's very important, as Angela and Mary have already highlighted, to be thinking about the role at the federal level, the state level, and the local level about initiatives that are happening and how these different agencies, different departments are working together in lockstep, because that's going to be very important in painting a more long-term picture and also in creating state-specific plans that are looking at a long-run vision for how they can support their students in, in particular. So when you think about just students, I'm going to take us back a little bit, a couple of years, about five years ago, when the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, was passed. And that was the K-12 overarching law that really helped support um, students and kind of spotlighted educational equity. It really brought educational equity more into the 21st century. There were a number of key block grants uh, focused at the state level that were to be allocated by the states to the schools deliberately to support the effective use of technology. So we're seeing that about five years ago, states were already in preparation mode to help their schools and help their students uh, get into uh, a scalable mode with digital learning. I would not say that, I, I can't say that there's evidence to, to uh, support that every state was prepared to handle digital learning at the school level when the pandemic hit because some states were and some states and some schools at the, so the state and local partnerships were, were working really well to uh, ensure that that schools had a uh, high quality personalized learning and digital learning uh, either in a hybrid format or in a virtual learning setting or a kind of a combination of the tools of, of the two. So some schools were doing that really effectively and some uh, sc some schools were not just not didn't have the capability and a lot of that. So the reason I brought up ESSA is because uh, there was a foundation for funding to go to schools and to support them with the with the with devices with hardware with software and with capabilities to create digital curriculum. And I'm going to come back to this point. So I just want to highlight that. So when the pandemic hit, educational equity and digital equity, and Angela can correct me if she thinks this might be incorrect to state this, but I feel like they converged at some point. There was this point where we were in a crossroads between educational equity and digital equity, and, and digital equity was not just a facet of educational equity anymore. So I might be a little bit too theoretical here, but you know, edu educational equity was now replaced with digital equity and the need for all schools, uh, I'm sorry, all students to have access to technology at home. Um, and uh, so I just want to, the reason I bring that up is because a lot of the funding that we're seeing that uh, states are using now from CARES Act um, needs to work really well with the way, uh, with a, a broader vision for how those title grants are going to be going to schools to support students as they come back either this year or next year. As you know, CARES Act doesn't expire till next year. So there is some flexibility with how quickly um, states are using the funds and how they'll be distributing those funds to the, to the school at the school level. 
Um, so there's that flexibility. And so we wanna be really thoughtful. We wanna ensure that states are coming up with best practices and um, providing some guidance to, to the local level officials to help them determine what is the best use of the funds. So just to highlight a few states, I feel like there's some states that have been a little bit more short, uh, have some more of a short-term vision and uh, some states that have created a long-term solution. And like Angela said, some of them have been working on that solution years prior to the pandemic, which made them a little bit more uh, ready and uh, ready to kind of deploy a, a, a really strong um, vision of that. So a couple of good, good examples of states uh, at the, uh, um, you know, during the pandemic, I, we saw that ABC, the uh, ABC program by the Alabama governor um, just uh, was, is now being implemented, but was released uh, in the announcement about it was released a few weeks ago, and it's going to be $100 million going out to 100,000 K-12 students. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it, but the a number of Alabama students um, in school is around 700,000, so that's, that's actually a sizable portion of the uh, school age population there, and they'll be getting internet access codes mailed to them. Really unique strategy where the states are kind of taking more of the um, onus on them to help with supporting internet connectivity. Uh, we're seeing a couple other states that are actually, uh, uh, for example, in Alaska, Governor Dunleavy has signed a bill that will double the minimum internet speed uh, for its state's K-12 schools. Again, kind of a unique solution that I haven't seen kind of replicated in other places. A lot of states are the traditional uh, things that they have to get in, um, in the hands of students is access to, to devices, hotspots, um, you know, internet connectivity, uh, providing the subscription uh, or group sub subsidized services. Um, but I'm just trying to highlight some of the innovative uh, sort of short and long-term solutions. So, um, and then I think governor uh, of Indiana had kind of created a multi-pronged approach uh, with uh, skills training as well included. And I think um, Nebraska's governor has actually dedicated funding for workforce development skills training for adult learners as well. So you're seeing kind of a unique kind of different tailored approach in each state. Uh, in terms of longer term solutions, I just wanted to highlight, I think two states really unique and you guys might've talked about Texas last time, so I'm not gonna belabor that one, but Virginia in particular, I just had a conversation with a state superintendent, James uh, Lane, and he was mentioning that they've been preparing for, not really preparing for, for the pandemic, but preparing for digital learning and for a more statewide learning management system to be deployed across, uh, across the state for all of their students. And so that virtual learning management platform actually provides all of the students in the state a voluntary option to um, be able to get online and get resources, both in an asynchronous and a synchronous format. And so it really kind of that preparation mode, same thing, I think Texas has done something similar where they're using the Schoolology platform um, to provide a voluntary option for all the schools and their students to have access to, um, and completely funded by TEA, uh, over the next two years to this platform. So it kind of just gives that backbone to, to schools to say if they don't already have a virtual learning plat, um, plan in place to uh, provide the state a role to play to provide some of that, uh, that fundamental um, virtual learning and uh, curriculum. And so that's just two I wanted to highlight in terms of long-term solutions. I think Massachusetts is, is, is also unique because they're working, their last mile program is working with the Massachusetts Broadband Institute to um, provide high-speed Wi-Fi hotspots. Governor Mike DeWine um, streamlined the process by working with Broadband Ohio, in, uh, Broadband Ohio, Innovate Ohio, and the Ohio Department of Transportation. So what we're seeing is that a lot of times it's not just the Department of Education's role um, uh, working with the state uh, offices, but uh, it could be a unique variety of different state agencies that are really playing an important role in helping students get access uh, both at home and also to the school curriculum working with the school with the schools so just wanted to highlight a couple of those uh great examples of what states have done so far and we're only a couple and, months into this and, and they're they are fascinating because of their breadth right yeah. and and in some ways they're idiosyncrasies of where each state has chosen to focus in terms yes. of battling this pro problem. It seems like there's a recognition that you can't approach all fronts at the same time in an emergency. So what you privilege is, is interesting and how you decide to privilege it uh, in terms of uh, trying to resolve it is fascinating. I was so struck listening to you um, talk about Virginia in particular and the notion of a statewide learning platform making them more ready for an emergency than they would have been because it takes me back to talking to a journalist in maybe March or April who was saying, why weren't school leaders ready for this? And I said to him, any district that had a ready to go immediate emergency remote learning plan all worked out would have been accused of wasting funds. None of us could have predicted that this particular type of emergency was coming, but what you're talking about really reflects how critical 
the larger level investments are in enabling a local response that is impactful and effective and can meet families' needs quickly. That even the most innovative of you know, district superintendents simply doesn't have the resources and the wherewithal to have done this alone. Um, so I find that fascinating. Let me ask you just one um, you know, sort of additional short question about HEROES Act allocations for, for connectivity and where you see that fitting into this picture as important both short and long term. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to talk more broadly about uh, broadband and kind of some of the proposals out there. But I do think it's worth noting, I mean, obviously, from this recent CARES Act package, uh, $30 billion was set aside for education for the Education Stabilization Grant Fund, and that focused on the governor's funds for $3 billion in funding and then $13 billion uh, of the ESER funds. And that was primarily um, school-specific funds. They, those were the funds that go to the schools. Larry kind of mentioned um, sort of the other uh, major agencies that uh, that did not receive any funding from the CARES Act, but should receive funds. So I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly now, not just focus on education. Um, so one particular proposal, I think, which is interesting, the Clyburn proposal, uh, which dates back to May of 2020, really does focus on this $100 billion one-time uh, package that would jumpstart the, the process. And of course, we're going to need additional funding going forward in a longer term uh, plan. But what it does is I think it, it calls out the need. Um, this is the uh, Accessible Affordable Internet for All Act. Um, and of course, it's not been passed yet, but it, so slithers of that has been pulled into uh, the um, proposal uh, for the, the fourth stimulus, potential fourth stimulus package, so for the HEROES Act. Um, so what that $100 billion package does is it really focuses on universal broadband access um, with $80 billion to deploy high-speed broadband infrastructure. Um, we're seeing allocating $5 billion for low interest financing of broadband deployment, ensuring internet afford affordability for um, different you know, types of communities. As we mentioned, some of the low income consumers would get $50 monthly discounts on plans. Um, and then promoting internet adoption by providing over $100 bill uh, sorry, $1 billion um, for state grant programs to close the gaps in broadband adoption. So again, you're, you're going to see the importance of funding at the state and local level and ensure that we, we want to ensure that we're closing the gaps by um, uh, by also um, identifying any duplications and uh, making sure that, 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 that any plan that comes out in a fourth stimulus package has already looked at what's been done up to date and where, where we need to go with it. So uh, I believe the HEROES Act does talk about, I think most recently updated as of September 2020, to, uh, would provide or designate $12 billion to close the homework gap by providing funding for Wi-Fi hotspots and connective devices, $3 billion for emergency home connectivity, $200 million for telemedicine grants, and $24 million for broadband mapping. This is more broadly speaking. And then there's also the education compo component that could also support schools and their students. Um, and so we, I think it's just about taking a really strategic approach and ensuring that any plan that, that is pulled together for the fourth stimulus package um, helps states and localities understand the bigger picture and what the vision is, which is that we want a really connected infrastructure um, across the nation and that we want to get there as soon as possible, but in the most efficient and effective manner. Um, and, and, so I, th and I think I think what you're doing really is highlighting the irreplaceable role that the federal government gets to play here, which is enabling that big picture rather than each state or each locality working on their piece and hoping that it will add up to, to you know, having completed the puzzle at the end of the day. And, and I think most of, most of us would agree that trying to do that without replicating uh, programs and, and only spending what we need to makes a lot of sense. So thank you very much for that. I wanna to turn to Jack, uh, if I can. Uh, hi, Jack, how are you? Hi. And I would just love um, to invite you to comment, share your reflections and insights from the perspective you know that, that you have in terms of uh, ensuring that students have what they need. I'm curious how you you know sort of respond to what we've heard so far. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Vicky, and thank you to uh, the campaign for greater level reading again for giving me another opportunity to participate in one of these webinars, and especially this time with such an esteemed group of experts. Uh, really honored to be a part of the program here. You know, as I'm listening to what Larry and uh, Angela and Divya have been saying, it's striking me that we're really at a big inflection point right now in the journey to close the digital divide. Uh, this is an opportunity. And it has the opportunity to be a really positive inflection point, depending on where we go from here. We've learned a lot of things through the pandemic and we've seen 
uh, really a lot of changing attitudes as a result of the pandemic, quite frankly, about the role of technology uh, in schools and at home for students and the role of the school uh, or the state uh, or the federal government to guarantee access to that technology. So uh, I'm gonna throw out a few stats that I've been seeing that, that sort of illustrate this point of these changing attitudes. Uh, before the pandemic, 44% of teachers said educational technology was very important. And today, 88% of teachers say that educational technology is very important. Uh, they've just lived through this and seen how important it, it, it can be. So we've, we've doubled the amount of teachers that say that it's very important. Uh, and we're not talking about just during the pandemic either. The pandemic will eventually end, right? At some point, we're going to get through this. Uh, things will start to you know, go back to normal, whatever that means now. Um, but even when we reach the point of the pandemic ending, uh, these issues aren't going away. And 75% of teachers and parents support more use of online learning for K-12 students after the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I doubt that uh, people were, uh, hung were, were hankering for, for more online learning before the pandemic. And we've heard a lot of stories about how difficult, quite frankly, it's been for families. Vicki, I know you're a parent yourself. You've been through it. You've seen the challenges firsthand. Um, but through all that, there's still, people still see the opportunity and they see that there can be benefits here if this is executed properly. Um, the, and by the way, these stats I just cited are from a report that uh, was just released within the last few days by the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, uh, and, and sort of the point I'm underscoring here is that to make these things a reality, to actually uh, achieve better use of technology uh, and to, to uh, after the pandemic ends, even, you know, capitalize on this opportunity more, we've got to make sure that every student has access to that technology, no matter where they are, no matter who they are, no matter what their background is. And at the most fundamental level, that means a dedicated learning device and internet connect connectivity. And providing those two things prior to the pandemic, again, changing attitudes, most people didn't consider that the responsibility of the schools, actually. They considered that the responsibility of the families to make sure that at home, you know, uh, to, to borrow one of Larry's terms, Junior and Juniette had had a internet and a device. That was the job of the families. Um, but I think Divya rightfully said that that during the pandemic we saw this internet, this intersection of, uh, I believe what you said, Divya was the uh, uh, educational equity mission and the the digital digital equity mission. Right? They became one and the same because you can't have edu educational equity without digital equity when everyone's learning online. Um, Absolutely. And, so, and, I and, I, and I think that that's been um, that what you're pointing to, I, you know, I just want to underscore uh, what I think is a critical point is that, you know, we are not that far from a point where even, you know, people at the federal leadership level really considered digital access to be a nice to have, but not a need to have that it was uh, you know, talk about whether or not a lower income people needed a cell phone or whether it was a luxury. We're not far from those conversations. And yet I think that we now have a national recognition that these are not nice to haves, that when we don't have uh, meaningful digital access, we can't do the things we need to do. And I, um, it is an opportunity, I think in the midst of all that we've been, that we've lost in the, these six months, um, is to capitalize on on the recognition that this is a necessity and not a luxury, um, and to kind of engage that shared recognition going forward for sure um, to be able to better serve our, our families and our students. Thank you, uh, Jack. We'll we'll be back. Um, let me let me uh, ask Claire um, if I can for you know thoughts and reactions from from your from your corner of. Uh, of these issues, uh, if, if you can comment on kind of what you've heard and anything you'd like to add. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks again to the campaign for grade level learning, uh, reading for having me back. Um, I think that if, like one thing that has been obviously re reiterated over and over is the fact that broadband access is not just like an accessory to our lives, but rather um, something akin to utility. And um, in our latest cost of connectivity report, we see that the average um, cost of internet in the United States per month does not reflect this. So um, something that we found in our report uh, where we looked at like 760 plans across 
Asia, Europe, and North America was that the average monthly price in the United States was the highest. Um, it comes to $68.38, which is a lot when you consider what you pay for all your other utilities combined per month. Um, and it's much higher than uh, prices for other countries and also um, comparing compared to other countries in North America. Um, so I think for me, very like what comes across is very important in this conversa conversation is centering it around affordability. Um, and we really need support at the federal level for existing uh, federal programs like Lifeline and E-Rate that already subsidize and discount internet service for low-income consumers. So that includes students and their families, but also public and private schools, libraries and districts through E-Rate. Um, and to reiterate, like these programs have already existed before the pandemic, but um, participation, for instance, in Lifeline, um, participation rates have gone down over the last few years, and that's a sign of decreasing support. So what we really need from agencies like the Federal Communications Commission is more support and more engagement there to get more people enrolled. Um, I think also another thing that comes to mind for at least lowering prices and uh, making sure that people are getting quality service for what they pay for is broadband competition and the federal government has a big role in this. So right now um, the broadband market is really consolidated. I'm sure that we could all name each other's internet service providers because there are only really three to four names in the space. Um, and I think it really is incumbent upon federal enforcers to more strongly enforce antitrust laws, um, prevent harmful mergers that will lead to just a few companies deciding how much we pay for our internet and um, even go so far as breaking up ISPs when they become too big. Um, and another thing that I've reiterated, reiterated on every panel that I've participated in is that uh, state legislation that prevents municipalities from building their own networks are really harmful. And um, these kinds of laws should be removed so that communities can decide for themselves whether building a new network might better provide for their community um, and bring better and more for affordable internet to um, their areas. So that's sort of where I'm Thanks. Coming. Thanks, Claire, for also reminding us how much of this comes down, or reminding us as if we could forget how much of this comes down to, you know, what you can pay and yeah. what you have to pay before you can pay for internet, you know, um, and that when you have to make hard choices, $68 is a lot of money to, to pay. And yet I know from my own research, uh, nationally and at local levels with low-income families, the things that parents will do without in order not to cut that internet connection, um, I know will not be you know, strange to many people on this call, but I think would shock uh, a number of people in the general public, just what they're willing to sacrifice to make sure that they can still afford something that is often unaffordable so that their children don't lose this connectivity. Thank you so much for that. And John, um, let me turn to you. Uh, and ask you for, for your reactions uh, from your perspective. Absolutely, thanks Vicki. And it's a real honor to be here uh, with everyone today. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to the campaign for grade level reading as well. And Angela, I share a soapbox with you about kids not living in isolation. And I think it's important to remember that when we lift up kids, we lift up families. And then when we lift up families, we lift up communities. And we talk about local solutions. That's a really great way to do that but on a federal scale with a coordinated effort that could be so much more impactful than what we're seeing right now. And you know, we talk about the three-legged stool or the three essential elements of digital access and it's, you know, it's that connectivity, the devices and the skills and support to use it, but it's a little bit deeper than that, right? The connectivity must be affordable. It has to be fast enough. You know, we're chasing the minimum, but the minimum is barely enough to get you through the Zoom requirements for a week, especially if you're on a data limit. So it's looking at things like that, the devices, but the right device for the needs, right? We, a Chromebook may not do much for a high school senior, but a MacBook Pro might be a little bit overkill for a fourth grader. And right? so we have to really think about, are we putting the right pieces in the right hands uh, in, as part of this puzzle? And when it comes to the skills and support, you know, we talk about how the, the children and the families need support to be able to enter this new learning environment, but I haven't heard as much talk about the teachers. <laughs> There's a lot of teachers out there that don't have uh, the support that they need to effectively shift their educational models to a digital platform. So I think it's equally important to have some direction and attention placed on that 
and there's a there's a federal role there to highlight the need for those uh, those elements, and all of that to me boils down to a but why, right? And all of this allows people to really participate in society as society continues to digitize. And Angela, I think it was you that mentioned you can't do hardly anything without the internet. You can't file unemployment. You can't apply for a job. There's so many barriers that are lifted with internet access. And if we want people to fully engage in society today, this is the minimum standard for that. Yeah, so, you know, John, as, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking um, about how much we've heard less about this uh, sort of collaboration and this sort of cohesive, holistic thinking about this lift up children, lift up families, lift up communities, right? That there's a sense of uh, sort of a virtuous cycle in that. And yet we hear much more about districts competing with each other uh, to try to make sure that they've got devices to their students for the start of a school year. And no surprise, you know, the district that had money in hand in May to purchase these devices are getting them ahead of schools that didn't have money in hand in May. And I'll, you know, leave it to everybody to guess which schools desperately need them more in terms of what kids have, you know, other options at home. Um, and so, you know, I think of the, that sort of district level or state level competition for resources. There's obviously a parallel to states competing for PPE at the beginning of the pandemic um, that highlights the, the federal role that can be played here in coordinating cooperation rather than inciting competition, um, especially when it diverts energy for district leaders away from directly serving families when, you know, they're preoccupied with, uh, you know, can we, can we just get the devices in people's hands instead of thinking about those all uh, important assistance pieces that are so important, the support for families when they have the devices in hand, right? Because that's a piece that so often gets left out. Um, and so I wonder if we might, um, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. And then I thought, you know, perhaps we'll be able to turn that over uh, uh, a little bit to have more of a conversation with the full panel about that. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're spot on, Vicky. And I think one of the one of the things that really highlights for me is, you know, you have school districts outbidding each other for a limited amount of devices. The money that they're spending over and above what a device would normally be procured for, where is that money going and how could that be put to better use? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think there's a there's a federal role in, in that line, too. And that's not my area, but I would love for someone to jump in that has a little bit more knowledge on how that might come to pass. But I do see a regulatory role being something of importance here as we, you know, the antitrust laws that you spoke to, Divya, those types of things are, are critical here where we can foster a spirit of cooperation rather than competition and see if we can collectively move forward. Because all these local solutions are incredible and they should be celebrated and should be talked about over and over and over again. But until there's a coordinated strategy across the United States, there's always going to be a divide. And so, Larry, I wonder if uh, we might bring this full circle back to you, if uh, if we can. Um, I, I'd love I'd love to know. You know, we are in the midst of. It, it's probably hasn't escaped anybody's notice on this call. That we, you know, we're in the midst of a, an election season, um, not an election day or an election week, but a, a, we are having a full season of it. Um, uh, and you know, I know that you've been part of uh, multiple transition teams. Uh, at the presidential level. And I'm just, you know, sort of curious what you see in this conversation about, you know, um, potential regulation, coordination amongst states and localities with regard to devices and, and other issues to address digital equity, whether or not there are kind of opportunities in this particular moment where we are looking, you know, potentially at a at either at a new administration in either case, right? Either the continuation of, of uh, President Trump's presidency or of uh, the beginning of Joe Biden's? This is a critical time. Um, I've, I've had the, the honor of being on two transition teams. I was on the uh, Clinton Obama, uh, the Clinton Gore transition team, and the Obama Biden transition team. Most of new policy gets done in the first 100, 200 days of an administration. But even before the, um, the swearing in on inauguration day, um, there are people who are going to be sitting down and working through how they get off to a, um, a flying start. How do we, and I'll, I'll go back to 2008. 
I was part of the team that helped think about the um, stimulus package. And we put $800 million into the BTOP program. And the BTOP program really did, re you know, we had a program called TOP, which was connected schools and hospitals and libraries. We took BTOP and we really went into middle mile. We, 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 advanced, uh, we started some of the first mapping exercises. We really went beyond what had happened at TOP. My expectation, I, I can't be part of a transition team and nobody's asked me, so I probably won't be part of the transition team this time. Um, but assuming there's a, a change in administration, um, there's an amazing opportunity to do almost all of the things that are being talked about here. I would assume that there'll be um, uh, significant dollars for rural broadband. I would assume there'll be significant dollars to increase and enhance the E-rate program. I'd assume there'd be a, a refresh and a relook at the at the um, 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 uh, E-rate program. I think we're looking at public housing and whether or not we can design in, um, if we're talking about lifting up families, think about low, low income families who are in public housing. We can start talking about that. I think there'll be some money going in there, rural health clinics. I think there'll be a real focus. If you look at what Jim Clyburn um, has been doing in the Senate, what my old boss, Ed Markey, and others are doing, I mean, doing in the House and Ed Markey and others are doing in the Senate, folks are really beginning to drill down on what are the problems, how do we address them? But it's also the policy, and that's what's so important. If you're on this call, if you're watching this, Talk to your senators, talk to your congressmen, talk to the folks you know, and ask them or the organization you belong to. The, the, the transition teams are going to be meeting with people and looking for ideas, and they're looking for the best ideas from um, uh, lots of folks. And, you know, an idea we're talking about um, grade level reading. And one of the ideas that um, I've been working on, in addition, how do we? Right now, we're all learning an incredible amount about um, education and what um, online education means. We're learning in the United States, we're learning in Britain, we're learning in Australia, the entire world has changed how they're teaching kids. And yet who's capturing um, lessons learned? Who's capturing best practices? Um, Angela works with a woman named Laura Breeden, who is kind of my Yoda, who's taught me almost everything I know about technology and technology policy. Um, and the thing that she drilled down on me is these kinds of moments, the lessons learned, the best practices, if you don't catch them now, they're ephemeral, you don't get them later. Um, and we have a chance to really think about um, you know, when I was listening to Jack talk about how uh, the number of people who are thinking about who are leaning into this, there is so much information that we'll never recapture in these eight or 10 or 12 months when people are rethinking pedagogy, rethinking what education means, rethinking um, what, how, how children learn. You know, and, and what is there a difference between low income children, different between different um, platforms use, different between whether or, not, you know, whether or not to use a laptop versus a, a tablet. Who's capturing that? Who's thinking that? Who's measuring that? And these are important conversations too. And I hope this um, transition team will look at all of those things and more. And I almost talked as fast as Divya, but not quite. <laughs> now, Divya is a lady after my own heart. I often get told slow. <laughs> and I, I love that case. I'm a New Yorker. That's how we talk. Exactly. Like, yes. A fellow yeah. spirit. Yeah, I'm actually I from think... Texas. So it's, I'm probably the, like the complete anomaly <laughs> for a Texan. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. No, I, I picked the right city to move to. I'm right at the New Yorker's uh, pace. It was too it was too quick when I lived in California. <laughs> but uh, Divya had me beat for sure. Um, Yoli, I wonder if uh, if you would like to uh, tee up some questions from uh, from our audience. I can, but let me just first um, say what a robust conversation this has been, and just how much you all bring in terms of knowledge, insight, experience for uh, all of the folks that are on the webinar. Um, so just lots to digest, but also a lot of great um, action-oriented messages that you're giving to all of us, which I think is so important. Um, we must act with urgency. Um, given what we're seeing and the impacts that are happening to so many children across the country. So thank you for that. Um, we've had a number of questions and I'm gonna try to synthesize them. Some of them were pretty long. Um, so let's let's get at them, Vicki. Um, I'll just tee them up and then um, folks can jump in. Um, so the first question comes from Dirk Hightower and Dirk's really asking the question about the carrot and the stick between the federal government and internet companies and sort of how we uh, use that power and leverage of the feds to have internet companies do a little bit more. Um, so the question is, is there an opportunity here to get internet companies to provide free internet for families in their area of service 
that meet a particular index of financial distress. So families in poverty, for example. Um, so I'm wondering if you all can speak to that relationship uh, between government and the private sector and how we might um, accelerate some partnerships with these providers. Hey, Yoli, I, this is Angela. I'm happy to take that one. I think it is possible. Uh, I think the, um, the political strength of the internet service providers is such that getting them to provide something for free will be a pretty heavy lift. Um, should we still ask for it? Sure. Um, but then I think we end up negotiating and where they were, those internet service providers were during the pan, you know, earlier days in the pandemic was discussing what the subsidy would be, how much they would get to provide that service to eligible households. Um, I think we also have to keep in mind that not all internet service providers are large companies. There are smaller companies and particularly in rural areas and some in, in urban and suburban areas who could not afford to do so. In fact, we hear from some of them now that they are struggling because folks can't pay their bills and they don't, because they're smaller, they don't have the um, financial strength like the bigger providers do to be able to absorb folks not paying their bills. Um, so, so I think the answer is yes, but. So let's like, let's push for it uh, and let's keep talking about it. But at the same time, we, there might need to be a solution that's somewhere in the middle. Can I just add on? Okay, I, think, yeah, come on in. I think that's, that's absolutely right. That there's nothing free. Somebody's gonna pay for it. And so either, either consumers are gonna pay for it because they're gonna add it onto the bills for everybody else, which is what the question asked, or the federal government's gonna pay for it. But I tend to think that what you can do and what should be done um, is increase lifeline subsidies to something between $25 and $50. And then and give, and I would actually give people a, a voucher, almost like script that they can use for any provider that they wanna use it for, against um, at, up to a certain level. And, and I think it has to the baseline. The other thing I would do is I would make it real broadband. I mean, right now, um, we have 25.3 simply isn't real broadband if you have more than a couple of people in your house and you're really trying to do significant um, this kind of, of interaction. There are those who disagree with me and that's okay. Um, but in 2008, I wrote um, a chapter for the FCC, a book called Change for America. It's over my shoulder, you can almost see it. Um, and we talked in 2008 about 100-100 uh, as being something we wanted to get uh, within by 2020, uh, by 2012, we're at 2020 and we're still giving people 25-3. And, and here's what's wrong with that. I'm a block and a half away from school. The kids who live on my block have a gig network as I'm talking to you all over a gig network. There are other kids in DC who are getting Xfinity's um, Internet Essentials and Comcast Infinity are doing something, but those kids have 25-3. Then between 25-3 and 1,000, if you're a teacher trying to do a, a great, and some kids have this, some that, and then you have other kids who have zero. By having an affordable upgraded lifeline. I mean, having a lifeline is a meaningful, um, accessible lifeline. We could get every kid in America something akin to a 100-100 and all of a sudden begin to equalize um, access to uh, technology. And then we have to think about the, um, the other side of it too, which is access to the instrument, which we don't spend enough time. And I'm glad that Angela and Divya are talking about that and Jack, because we don't start thinking about access to the, inst to the instrument as well as access to the internet. What have we done? You know, what's the point of having access to a fast speed if you don't have something to use on use it on? The other issue, I just jump in really quick, is the I think well, what the federal government is currently doing right now is the federal they're working on the Federal Broadband Data Act and implementing that, which is passed in, in, in May of this year, and really thinking more strategically about how to uh, uh, increase the accuracy of our maps currently um, to ensure that underserved communities are all being uh, accurately served and um, that there's a better procedure in place to make that happen. And so at the federal level, that's, uh, that has been enacted. And I think now it's about implementation and ensuring that, that, that those procedures and protocols uh, can be uh, useful in, in the next generation. So for example, with uh, deployment of 5G, we wanna ensure that we're accurately mapping before we go ahead with 5G initiatives that are statewide or that are across the rural populations. And again, we don't wanna be missing a lot of those underserved communities that really need access. So I think the data piece, the data mapping piece is really important. A couple of states have also uh, produced kind of these legislative proposals around what they could be doing. So Georgia is actually one that has created its own broadband availability map. But I think if there was a more 
a comprehensive strategy around this mapping uh, plan that we could probably make more progress to get the right, uh, the, the, con the connectivity and the options in the hands of all the underserved folks that really need them. By mentioning 5G, you triggered one thing I do have to mention, which is redlining. Um, it, the, 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 the Federal Communications Commission is taking some tools out of the hands of localities and states to prevent wireless providers from redlining low income districts and minority districts. And that's something that I hope the next FCC will look at as well. Um, you don't want to overregulate people who are investing, but you certainly don't want to give incentive or at least increase the likelihood that folks who really need access don't have access. Again, looking at New York City, Right now, 40% of small and uh, medium-sized businesses in New York City don't have access to um, a, a gig network. And almost all of those um, small businesses are in Black, Brown, and Asian communities. We've got to make sure that redlining is not an issue going forward. Good point, um, Larry. Thank you for uh, lifting that up. I'll just call attention very quickly to the poll that just popped on to everyone's screen. As you're hearing the Q&A, if you would take just a minute to respond to the poll, it helps us with our continuous improvement. So really, really appreciate that. We can't vote. I was going to self-grade and, and change the curve. <laughs> we'll just make sure it's a high, a high grade. Um, do our commentators want to comment on that and the impact or relationships you've had with your local providers? And then we'll move on to the last two questions. One thing I'll say, and this might actually get it, I'm reading ahead in the questions, the, the, some of the things that are actually highlighted in the next two questions is, we have seen a, a shift in attitudes on the part of the providers a little bit, as we've seen a shift in attitudes in uh, schools and, and politicians and federal officials. And uh, while we certainly don't have the service providers where we want them and need them to be, uh, there's some promising developments that have been happening. And Specifically, uh, one of those developments is service providers creating more offerings tailored to school districts or, or states who are looking to solve this problem on behalf of all of their families, as opposed to going straight to the families. Um, and one of the terms being used in the industry is a sponsored service arrangement. So this is something Comcast has had for a while, but now all the providers are sort of copying that and saying, okay, we're going to create an offering that's sort of tailor made to, to this specific need. Um, and I, I think the work that we all have to do is to hold the service providers accountable for making sure that those offerings are meeting the needs uh, and are uh, delivering what's needed for the students and for the schools. And it's a work in progress. It's, it's still kind of early days, but um, you know, the, we're gonna need the providers to be part of these solutions. And so let's, let's keep pushing them in the right direction and encouraging them when they do the right things and when they, when they show a willingness to do the right things. Um, so that so that we can uh, all work together to to achieve equity in this area because it's to solve any broadband problem it's it's a big tent problem is what I say it's it takes everyone working together to to really um, get the solution. Jack, I think yeah, there's, and, a, there's a challenge with some of those in that the school, particularly when the school is the customer and they're looking at solving it. This goes back to that family versus child type of situ situation. So some of the providers are offering internet services that have the um, security protocols in place because it's for the child, but then it's not meeting the needs of the family because it, it has limited usage to it. So it's a, it is a challenge and we have to figure that out. Um, we're also seeing a weirdness where um, the discount offers that are available to individual families, to households, is different than what they're offering in these sponsored or, or single payment payer agreements. Um, AT&T and Charter are like that. It's not the same. You can't go from one to the other. So there's, a, there's still a lot more conversation that needs to take place about those so that we can get those offers to be more valuable to the whole family. Really yeah, just to jump in on that, you know, like, you know, my, yeah, just to jump in on that too, there's one other question to consider here, and that's that there's a lot of barriers that are in place to qualify for those type of programs as well, if it's not in that single sponsored element. So for example, I know in, in a few providers, you can't have been a previous customer within the past 60 days or the past however long 
So sometimes if you've already made those sacrifices to have the internet, which we know uh, unequivocally that a lot of folks are making, now you have an option, a possibility to have something that's affordable and you don't qualify. So we have to make sure that we're having those conversations with providers as well. A uh, great reminder, um, John, thank you for that. Um, let me move on to a question from our colleagues at United Way. And United Way is uh, an important partner for the campaign. They're, um, they're supporting um, a large majority of the campaign community. So really glad to have them on the webinar. Um, and this one comes specifically from United Way in California. So the question is very specific to California. Um, and it sounds like they've been making strides with partnerships with the California Public Utility Commission and the California Emergency Tech Fund um, around um, school districts and um, facilitating enrollment, um, and I presume enrollment into use of technology for students all at once. And there've been some um, successes there. They've got, garnered some attention. Um, and they're also speaking to the Digital Divide Task Force making recommendations. So really appreciate the engagement and involvement of United Ways in California. The question is uh, around encountering the timing of enrollments and whether um, as a collective group, they can advocate for shorter enrollment periods so that households get reliable internet much faster. Anybody have insights on that? I actually don't know what she means by enrollment periods. Most of the, it might, might be a California thing, most or a school specific situation, but in general, there's not a requirement. There's nothing that keeps an enrollment period to being a certain time period. Um, the arrangements that some of the schools and other community entities have with the providers for these sponsored or single payer agreements um, that is very much like a contract that they have and so they set the terms of that contract i don't know of any of them that have a limit as to a time period as to when the enrollment needs to stop actually the opposite seems to be true is that they will buy a certain number of accounts and then families aren't taking them up on the free accounts there's a variety of reasons for that. The biggest one seems to be free internet. Sounds like a scam. Mm -hmm. so, so they're having to deal with like trust issues around the program that they've set up. Um, so maybe Divya or someone else has information. Well, I can, it's, it's possible that maybe what the question is referring to is um, not necessarily the enrollment, but the actual activation of the service. Um, so I think everything you said is spot on, Angela there have definitely been challenges in terms of once we've got all the agreements in place and okay, school agrees, service provider agrees, family agrees to take service, there's still been a lot of barriers in turning up the service, right? It's supposed, I believe the FCC has some sort of a definition of serviceability. It says it should be, turned, be able to be turned on within 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, and so on the ground, we're not seeing that happen uh, for whatever reason. And I think part of that uh, can probably be attributed to its early days. We're still working out a lot of kinks <laughs> in, in these programs. And, um, but, but uh, you know, that's feedback that, that the providers need to hear and need to be held accountable for, quite frankly, as if the, the agreement was that, you know, service should be turned on within a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. um, there needs to be a kind of an accountability mechanism there too. So uh, I don't well, let me just offer this to our colleagues at United Way and Alicia Lara at United Way Worldwide and I are working together. She's watched every one of the digital equity webinars. So I'll follow up and if there's more that we can assist, um, you know, they're, again, they're doing their part across the country to make sure that our families have um, and our students have what they need in terms of uh, broadband and internet. Um, there was a, I love how folks are getting creative about how we solve this problem. Marcus Watkins is wondering whether a lack of internet and devices for a student could be considered a public health issue and if Medicaid could cover that. I think the answer is, uh, yeah, we just got to convince people that that's the way it should work. No, when you, when you look at the pandemic, 27% of senior citizens in our country don't have access to broadband. 
And so, if you know, I I would assume that for a senior citizen, when you look at the mortality rates for folks over 65 and over 70, over 80, that not having access to telehealth. And we've also seen something else go on. Prior to the pandemic, only 11% of American Americans had uh, utilized telehealth as a as a way to access health benefits. Now up over 44%, um, and that number is going up. So there, this conversation is going to be had very shortly um, on, an, on, a, on, a glo on a much wider basis. Um, there have been a lot of challenges with regard to telehealth, as other people know, with regard to funding, with regard to licensing, with regard to jurisdictions. But those are breaking down as more and more people say, you know, I'd like to see my doctor, but not badly enough to sit around a room with a bunch of other sick people. Um, and so I think that we're closer to those kinds of conversations than we might think. And um, I don't know if Medicaid is going to cover it immediately, but I do think we're gonna we're on an arc toward that. Great. We all have to stay as creative as possible. Um, there is one last question. It's pretty specific, but it could be helpful to other people in other communities. And that's how do we go about getting an antenna through spectrum for our community? I saw that, was that spectrum the company or is that spec? I, I didn't quite understand the question, but if the question is what I was talking about with regard to the two and through, there are various entities looking at that whole question now of, if a school, if a public facility, um, we've been looking at historically black colleges and universities, lots of, and tribal colleges, um, Hispanic serving institutions. If there is an entity that has a um, broadband pipe and has a building and is near a community that's at risk, um, can we use spectrum such as EBS, Education Broadcast Service, CRBS, Community Radio Broadcast Service, I think it is. Can we use those type, those spectrum um, uh, resources to um, give people wireless access to broadband near those public buildings or public facilities. That's something that's it's early days, but there's lots of good experimentation. It is a low cost way in for folks like Claire, who's been talking about how do we create communities, um, alternatives to the relatively consolidated industry. This is one way, but to Angela's point, a lot of those network schools and libraries that have filters on them, they have security built into them. There are things we have to work through. But the cost, when you look at the cost benefit of giving particularly school age children um, low cost access to robust wireless resources, that's a near term alternative that has a lot of promise. But it's, it, you know, feel free to reach out to me, L Irving at irvinggroup.com, Larry Irving at Gmail, Larry Irving at AOL. I'm, if it's, if it's Larry Irving, it's probably me. Um, and I'm happy to try to have a, a, a deeper conversation if that's something of interest to your community or to you personally as, um, because there's a lot going on, but it's hard to explain in like 30 Thank seconds. And, and I usually try to get my tech guy as opposed to me, the lawyer, um, to uh, work through it. Thank you, Larry. And, and everyone's contact info is in the bios that we shared, um, either email or their um, social media handles. Jack, you were trying to get in and then we're going to wrap up. I just put it in the chat, but if the question was about Spectrum, the provider, I just put a link into uh, their, some information about the program they have. And Larry did a fantastic job at answering the uh, uh, Spectrum as a solution uh, for broadband Spectrum's uh, version of the question. So thank you, Larry. Uh, we're at the end of our questions and I wonder, Vicki, if you um, want to make a final comment, um, if you're still on, I know you have sure. to leave immediately. No, I'm here. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted just listening to everybody uh, answer these questions and that even the questions where we're not sure whether spectrum means a company mm -hmm. or the actual spectrum itself, we've got comprehensive answers on both, on both fronts uh, really reflects just how broad and deep the expertise on this, on this uh, panel are. Um, I'm, I just want to thank all of you for what I consider to be an absolute honor to have been uh, able to be part of this conversation and to learn uh, from all of you and to have had, uh, you know, some moments of, uh, of inspiration and learning in a, in a week where I feel like I'm a little too distracted by the news of the day. So thank you for these uh, really um, innovative and substantive looks at not just what the federal can do, but also to lift up what's happening at the, at the state and local level to ensure that we are not leaving kids and families behind when there's a way that we can bring them where they need to be. So thank you very much to the campaign for uh, providing a platform for this conversation and for enabling me to be a small part of it. Great.
Thank you, Dr. Vicki Katz. Um, we're just grateful that you were moderating this uh, vibrant conversation. Doc, thank you to Larry, to Angela, to Divya, to Jack, to Claire, and to John uh, for joining us. Uh, we do hope to have um, a follow-up conversation once we know who the next administration is. Um, so we may um, invite you back if you're available. We would love to have you back. So uh, thank you all. Thank you for um, inspiring us with so much information. Let me just um, share as we're closing out um, our upcoming GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars, and we would love you for you to join us. Next week, I think this is the first week since last year that we will not have a Tuesday webinar. Um, it's probably the most important day in a century. Um, next Tuesday's election day. So please, please, please vote, vote, vote. Um, but then we're back every Tuesday on November 10th um, and on November 17th, we'll have double hitters. Uh, at uh, 1230 on November 10th, we'll have a presentation by our colleagues in Charlotte, North Carolina and uh, conversations for our state and community leads uh, where they're learning and sharing with them from each other. At three o'clock, we'll have the future of early math, what science and practice tells us. And then the following week on November 17th, we'll have a funder to funder conversation in the 1230 Eastern time hour with the Clinton Family Foundation and Too Small to Fail. And then at three o'clock on the 17th, we will uh, focus on parent coaching, a key ingredient to parent success. So we hope you will all join us. Until then, be safe and healthy and have a great rest of the week. <laughs>